it would probably be, be most profitable for us to move over to chapter 10 and we can concentrate for a time on Galatians 2.20 and how that reckoning has to do with that truth, counting upon that truth. And we want to notice that the fact that Galatians 2.20 really has to do with the law. If we look at verse 19, Paul says, For I, through the law, died unto the law, that I might live unto God. And that's what the law did to him, and that's what the law does to us. The law shows us that we're lost sinners. And the law really uh, takes us to the Lord Jesus Christ. The law takes us to grace. The law brings us to the end of ourselves, and uh, there we see the Lord Jesus having done which we find we cannot do. So that the law works for the unsaved in bringing them to the Savior, and the law works for the saved, uh, taking them beyond the Savior to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life. The Christian who only knows the Lord Jesus as his Savior uh, never gets very far in growth, because the Savior saves us. The Lord Jesus in his work as Savior causes us to be born again. The Lord Jesus as, his, as our life causes us to grow. And uh, our Father uses the law to create needs in our lives so that we ultimately come to the Lord Jesus and say, well, Lord Jesus, I've found out through trying to live the Christian life that I can't do it. Things that I would, I do not, and the things that I would not, I do. And the law is carrying out its ministry and showing us our failure as Christians. And it finally uh, brings us to the end of ourselves. It finally brings us down to the old wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? It finally brings us to the place where we are conditioned and where we're ready to see our identification with the Lord Jesus. The fact that we died in him unto sin at Calvary, the fact that we died unto the law. The law said, uh, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And that's what we find out happened to us, that we died in Christ unto the law. The sinner, not only did, did the Lord Jesus die for our sins, he alone could do that, he was perfect, but the sinner, the sinner died in Christ. We died unto the world, we were crucified unto the world, we died unto, unto sin, we died unto the law, and we're to count it so. For I, through the law, died unto the law, and now he's free to live unto God, that I might live unto God. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto the law, and reckon yourselves to be alive unto God in Christ. That's a part of our reckoning, a part of our counting upon those facts. And then he explains it all here in verse 20. <clears throat> and it's important for us to use our authorized, uh, our ASV, here here especially not the King James the King James is not clear enough for one thing but uh, the ASV makes it very clear where Paul says I have been crucified with Christ with Christ well one was the Lord Jesus crucified he was crucified back at Calvary and every Christian has been crucified the old life has been crucified in him the old Adamic nature, we, uh, that life has been cut off at Calvary and has been annulled and put out of business. And we get that benefit of that freedom as we count upon that fact. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, a Christian cannot really say that until he knows the truths of Romans 6. Many, many Christians use Galatians 2.20 as their life verse and all, but a few of those Christians really, really know that they have been crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. And it is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Well, what I is this? It's the old I 
the eye that has to do with Adam, the old self-life. That the Christian is not living in the self-life. His, his the self-life is no longer the source of his life. Uh, Christ is the source of his life now. That his history in Adam ended at the cross. It is no longer I that live, the old I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the wonderful secret of Galatians 2:20. It's a wonderful secret of our identification that our old history ended at the cross and our new eternal history be history began in our resurrection in Christ. We were recreated in Him as new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things are become new for our, our new Christian life. But Christ liveth in me, and that life which I now live in the flesh, or in this body, I live in faith. The faith, uh, I exercise faith, I, I count upon the Lord Jesus as my life. I reckon myself to be alive unto God in Christ Jesus. The life which I now live in the body, I live in faith. The faith which is in the Son of God. It isn't the faith in the old life, it isn't faith in my uh, fleshly abilities to live as a Christian, if there were any. It's not faith in self at all, or anyone else. It's faith centered in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, who loved me and gave himself up for me. And uh, Galatians 2.20 uh, gathers all of these identification truths together and, and fits them in the one single verse. It's interesting to see here where Paul says, but Christ liveth in me. And he's speaking here of me as a new creation in Christ Jesus, the new life. The Lord Jesus doesn't live in himself. He doesn't live in the old life. He has rejected that life completely, and God took it to the cross for crucifixion. But the Lord Jesus lives in me as a new creature in him as the life of the vine lives in the branch. So that uh, we're living now in the Lord Jesus. We're no longer living in the flesh. Our life isn't drawn from the fleshly source. Our Christian life is drawn from uh, the holy, righteous source, uh, the life of the Lord Jesus. And uh, this is a wonderful thing to realize, a wonderful thing to be sure of that we are free to walk in the Spirit because we've been uh, cut off from the fleshy life. And there are more of these truths in uh, Philippians 3.10. We might turn over to that verse, which is in our 11th chapter, and think about that verse for a bit in connection with these truths. <coughs> where Paul, who has been a Christian many years here, when he writes this verse, and he, he says that I may know him, that I may know the Lord Jesus more fully. And that not just uh, knowing about him, but knowing him personally. That we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from experience to experience even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Knowing Him in that way, that uh, we grow in Him, that he, he is manifest more definitely in our daily lives because He lives through us. Knowing Him in that way. And of course, that's, uh, that's what the whole uh, Christian life is all about. As we see in John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent that I may know him. And uh, that's what God is taking us, uh, why he takes us through all these different things. So that we get to know ourselves better and turn from our old life and we come to see more fully our new life in him. See the one who is our new life and get to know him better. That I may know him. 
<clears throat> and Paul says, and the power of his resurrection. Well, <clears throat> the first thing we learn about the power of his resurrection is the fact that uh, he took us down into death at Calvary. And he brought us up into new life, his life, in the power of his resurrection. And it's very important that we know this power of his resurrection. We know about it so that we know that we're uh, in the risen Lord, that we know our position in him. That he has, uh, in his great mer rich mercy and great love, <clears throat> that he's quickened us together with Christ. And we've been raised up together in him, as we see in Ephesians 2.4. The power of his resurrection uh, recreated us and placed us uh, in the Lord Jesus at the Father's right hand. That's where we are today, each one of us. That's our position. That's the source of our Christian life. Alive unto God in Christ. That's where we're to reckon ourselves. Reckon ye also to be alive unto God in Christ Jesus. And as we learn to abide there and count upon that fact, his, uh, the life of the Lord Jesus is more and more manifested in our mortal body here on earth. We learn to yield ourselves to him as those that are alive from the dead in the power of his resurrection. But we can't. Uh, we can never do that by faith if we don't know that we've already been raised. If we don't know anything about the power of his resurrection, <clears throat> and of course that isn't the only power uh, way that we'll know the power of his resurrection because when we receive our new bodies we, and we're uh, resurrected, physically resurrected uh, w that same power will we'll carry that out the power of his resurrection because he's already resurrected us and our, our physical resurrection will just simply be the carrying out of what he's already done uh, for us spiritually for our citizenship is in heaven. And that's where, that's why we're waiting for the Savior to, to come and uh, receive us. And he'll fashion new the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. According to the working whereby he is able even to subject all things unto himself. Wherefore, my brethren, beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, Paul says to us in Philippians 3.20. And uh, 4.1. Fashion anew the body of our humiliation will receive our resurrected bodies all through the power of his resurrection. And then there's this uh, third point in this wonderful verse of Philippians 3.10 that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings. <clears throat> well, Paul certainly uh, suffered a great deal for the Lord Jesus and he did it in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. He uh, suffered many of the sufferings that the Lord Jesus experienced went through many of the same things. The Lord Jesus took him through these things that he might understand, that he might know the Lord Jesus in his sufferings as well as his glory, as well as his peace, and as well as his joy. And the little things that we have to go through are the fellowship of the Lord Jesus' sufferings, that we might know him better. Many of our sufferings uh, we experienced because of our sinfulness and because of our waywardness and because of our selfishness. Whereas the Lord Jesus wants us to uh, suffer for his sake, that he, uh, we might come to know him better, we might be more and more conformed to his image. And that's why God, uh, the Holy Spirit, delivers us unto death day by day, all way delivered unto death. That we uh, might be conformed to his uh, image in, in his suffering, fellowship of his sufferings. And they're all, all of them are uh, geared for our development, for our growth. They're all working together for our good. And Paul wants us to have the same attitude that he had. He said uh, of all of his sufferings, he said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering." That it was all in the mercy of God that he had to suffer. 
for a pattern to them which should afterwards believe on him to life everlasting. Paul was our pattern. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Well, uh, so many Christians think that something's wrong when they have to go through suffering. They think that uh, maybe God has uh, forsaken them to some degree or hasn't really taken care of them or that they're suffering because of uh, something they did wrong. Whereas all of the suffering is used by God to uh, make us a deeper Christian, make us more like His Son, the suffering Savior. And we can learn uh, more, get to know the Lord Jesus infinitely better through suffering than we can through happiness and joy. Self is the element within us that doesn't want to suffer wants to be uh, self-centered and happy-fied all the time. But uh, the Christian who's growing and who hungers and yearns to be like the Lord Jesus and to know Him better, he uh, loses a lot of his fear about suffering. And he rejoices and glories in the cross as the cross cuts into his life and cuts into the self-life and takes him down into death day by day. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in his mortal flesh. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. That we find the comfort and the joy in Him uh, because of our needs created by suffering. It drives us to Christ and causes us to abide in Him and to rest in Him and depend upon Him. And then this final thought in the verse of being made conformable unto His death. Well, uh, as we're all the way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, we're more and more conformed to the death of the cross. We gain more and more of the benefit of the crucifixion, where self is held more and more in a place of death. And it becomes a part of our life that uh, as we die, uh, to the old life, as the old life is held in a place of death, uh, the Lord Jesus... Uh, is more and more manifest. His life springs out of the, his resurrection life springs out of that death. Out of the tomb of the old life, uh, the new life arises. And that's the law, that's uh, the one follows the other. And that's, uh, that's being made conformable under his death. We, we experience the crucifixion of the cross in our old life, in our self-life, day by day. As we reckon ourselves to have died and need unto sin, as we reckon self to have been crucified. So that's, uh, that's another verse where all of these truths are gathered together. Uh, Philippians 3.10 And now we might turn over to our chapter 12 and take a look at Colossians 3, uh, where the same, same truths are brought out. Colossians 3. And uh, Paul starts uh, at the other end in, in, this, uh, in this chapter where he says, uh, If or since then ye were raised together with Christ. And he, in other words, he's saying, Know ye not that you, were, uh, that you are in the risen Lord, that we've been uh, resurrected in him. That's our position. That's the source of our life. He's saying, since we are <coughs> raised and uh, seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, that uh, seek the things which are that are above, where Christ is seated, uh, seated at the right hand of God. <coughs> and that's that's where our attention should be, in our risen Lord. not uh, be taken up with ourselves and our problems and uh, sin which so easily doth beset us 
but uh, our new life in Christ. Not to be concerned about self, but be concerned about Christ. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, because that's where we are. That's where we should be. That's where our thinking should be. Our attitude. Well, I'm, I'm alive unto God in Christ risen. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, uh, many Christians get off to a poor start, and uh, they get all taken up with themselves and with the things of the world, and it makes it very difficult to, to concentrate upon the Lord Jesus. How can a, how can a Christian concentrate upon uh, <clears throat> his position in the Lord Jesus in, up in glory, far above all of the uh, sin and circumstance of this uh, poor, dark world, if he's uh, spending hours a day looking at television, for instance, and uh, all of the things of the world, no matter how good the programs are, they're, they're things of the world, they're, they feed the self-life, they don't feed the Christ life. The Lord Jesus doesn't need what the television industry produces, not for an instant. And of course, the whole thing works around the other way, too. If uh, a Christian doesn't really uh, know the Lord Jesus as his life, if he doesn't know how to feed upon the Lord Jesus and doesn't really know him uh, in a full enough way, he doesn't, he's not satisfied really with the Lord Jesus. He needs these things of the world to, uh, in an attempt to gain satisfaction, <clears throat> to gain uh, some happiness. But for the Christian, the Lord isn't going to allow that. He, he spoils all of that. He doesn't let it satisfy. Uh, the worldly things don't even satisfy the old life, let alone the new life, Christian life. So that uh, this may go on for years, but uh, sooner or later the Christian becomes so hungry so dissatisfied with anything short of the Lord Jesus that uh, he turns. <clears throat> he sets his affection upon things above, not on things on the earth. And uh, in verse 3 here, uh, Paul gives the truth of uh, the facts underlying all this. For ye have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We... Uh, we died to the world. We've been crucified to the world. We've been crucified to the old. We've been. Uh, we've died to the old life. And uh, the source of our life now is in the Lord Jesus. He's our life. And we can enjoy Him now. And uh, when He appears, we will appear with Him in glory. And uh, in verse five, Paul <coughs> says, "Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth." fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the sons of disobedience, in the which ye also once walked when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Now, when did the Christian put off the old man with his deeds? Seeing that ye have. Well, that happened uh, positionally, judicially, in God's eyes. That happened back at Calvary when we died to the old life and were risen in the new. That we were cut off from Adam, we were cut off from the old man. Our old man was crucified at Calvary. And God wants us to see that and to count upon it. And that gives the Holy Spirit freedom to nullify the power of the old life. And his deeds are less and less manifest in the Christian life, in the Christian walk. Less and less the works of the flesh. Seeing that ye have put off the old man. When the Word tells us to put off the old man, the Word is really telling us to count upon ourselves as being free from the old man. We put him off by faith. We put him off by realizing he has been put off in, at the cross. Before you died unto sin and self, the old man. 
that you have put off the old man. It isn't a matter of struggling to get off from under the realm of the old man. It isn't a matter of fighting to, to hold him off and put him off and get off from under him. No. It's a matter of seeing that God has already uh, cut us off from him and renewed us in Christ. That'll put him off. That'll put him off in experience because he's already been put off uh, in our position. Back here in verse 5, where Paul uses the term mortify. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. <clears throat> well, our, our, depending upon the new life and rejecting the old life, uh, the Holy Spirit brings the death of the cross into our life. We're all the way delivered unto death. And that death is uh, the mortification of the old life. It uh, holds the old life in the place of death. and. Our, uh, our body and our uh, the flesh, the old life, is not able to uh, bring forth the works of the flesh, the sin. That's, uh, that's the mortification of the old life, the work of the cross. Now here in verse 10 we have this wonderful truth again, where Paul says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Well, when did the Christian put on the new man? Well, the new man is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And uh, he's brand new. We recreated in him. He's the new risen life, eternal life. And we put him on when the Holy Spirit baptized us into Christ, when we were recreated in Christ at Calvary, when we uh, rose again. That's put him on. That's put him on. And the knowledge the image of him that created him, uh, the image of God who created us. He recreated us in Christ. And uh, that life is in the image of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the image of God because Christ is the express image of the Father. And our new life, our Christian life, is uh, renewed in God's image. And as we grow, that image is more manifest, because the Lord Jesus is more manifest in our daily, in our uh, mortal body, in our daily life. And when we see him, we shall be fully like him, because we shall see him as he is. <clears throat> we see him today through the Word, through our understanding of the Word, and uh, through to the extent that we allow the Holy Spirit to minister the Word to us. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. And have put on the new man. Well, if we really realize that we're uh, renewed in Christ, uh, we're not going to have to struggle to try to be like him, are we? We're simply going to uh, love him and fellowship with him and uh, get to know him in his risen position where we are. In him, uh, our life is hid with Christ in God. And uh, the result of that fellowship is uh, our Christian growth. Uh, what we're counting upon in him becomes uh, manifest in us. Reckon yourself to be alive unto God in Christ. And have put on the new man. Wonderful truth. Finished work. We gain the benefit of it by counting upon it as we see it. As we see these truths, it's easy to count upon them. If we're not too sure about these things, if we haven't uh, studied carefully enough and waited long enough to really see, our reckoning won't amount to a thing. It'll be all effort. It won't be faith. And we won't get anywhere. So we want to carefully prepare before we set out. We want to depend upon the Holy Spirit to show us these truths clearly before we attempt to gain the benefit of them through faith. Well now, <clears throat> there's something very important I'd like to talk to you about for a bit. If you turn to First John in your Bibles, 
First <clears throat> John one. And we'll begin at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And that's that's why Christians um, don't have the joy of the Lord. That's why they are depressed and uh, down most of the time, is because they are not in fellowship with the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ. because they don't uh, see where God has placed them in Christ and that he is their life and that they have been freed by the work of Calvary, They've been freed from the old life that is uh, keeping them from fellowship, that they're all taken up with self and the struggle to keep self down and they're in no condition, they don't have any time or inclination left for fellowship because they're uh, in this um, struggle to keep their head above water, so to speak. And that's why it's so important for us to see these truths that we, we can uh, realize our freedom in Christ. This, then, is a message which we uh, have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And uh, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And then uh, the wonderful verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Well, how does a Christian walk in the light? Well, first he has to see that he's, he's been placed in the light. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is uh, the light. He was the light of the world when he was here, and he's the light of glory now that he's in glory. He's the light. And uh, we must see that uh, our life is hid with Christ in God, Christ who is the light. And we can walk in the light when we see that the light is our position, the light is our uh, place, that we abide in Christ, we're in the light. Uh, God has placed us in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yes, the Christian knows that he has sinned, that he sins. But he also is to learn that uh, the remedy for sin, once he sins, and that is to confess that sin. Specifically confess it, not confess uh, that he's sinful, uh, he knows that and God knows that, but to confess the specific sins. And when we uh, realize that we're in the light, that light reveals our sin, it makes us all the more conscious of our sin. But the fact, uh, realizing the fact that we're in Christ, who is the light, gives us freedom to confess that sin, no, sin knowing very well that uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the reason that we can be sure that he uh, is free to forgive our sins and to cleanse us is because he already has done it at Calvary. He's uh, settled the sin question completely, but God wants us to acknowledge our sins so that he doesn't have to uh, <clears throat> judge us and to uh, 
child trainers to chasten us for our sin. If we don't judge ourselves and confess our sin, God is going to have to uh, deal uh, firmly with us and uh, chasten us. <clears throat> and of course, there are times that even when we do confess our sins and uh, we know that we're forgiven and cleansed from the unrighteousness, God still has to oftentimes uh, child train us because the sins that we get into, they have their uh, results and God has to uh, deal with us accordingly to uh, train us and to teach us. But there's no uh, no condemnation. The, the sins can never condemn us because there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ has hath, uh, freed us from the law of sin and death. And uh, this is an area that uh, is in the shambles with m most Christians today, that they're no longer really confessing their sins. They're no longer sure of his forgiveness of their sins and of the cleansing and of their, their fellowship restored. They're no longer depending upon that. They're just getting along uh, as best they can, and uh, they're so overwhelmed with the self-life, and uh, there's a great wall of sin that is built up between them and God that they're completely out of fellowship with God. And they're just uh, getting along as best they can. There's no happiness and no joy for them in the Christian life, and uh, even their church life and, uh, is gone. Uh, lose the joy of the uh, fellowship with other Christians, and let alone fellowship with God. And uh, just uh, no longer even uh, love to go to church. Uh, church becomes a, a burden to them, and uh, just uh, they can hardly face the weekend, and hardly face Sunday. Completely out of fellowship, not only with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father, but they're out of fellowship with everybody else. And that's the uh, <clears throat> net result of a lack of confession, a lack of belief that when we do confess our sins that he is free to forgive us our sins. And if the Christian isn't sure and doesn't know how thoroughly the work of the cross dealt with his sins and dealt with the, the sinner, him the sinner, well, naturally, he's uh, after a while he's going to give up his uh, confession of his sins because he doesn't really believe that they're forgiven. And he doesn't really believe that that confession and the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses away that uh, sin and cleanses away the unrighteousness of that sin. And he doesn't believe that he's free to fellowship with the Father once again in the light. He thinks that he's been taken out of the light and that he's in darkness. Well, the only reason he's walking in darkness is because he's not. Uh, his eyes are off the Lord Jesus and he doesn't realize his position, that he's uh, hid with Christ in God in the light. All he's asking once we sin is that we confess that sin. And of course the Christian who is reckoning himself to have died indeed unto sin and is alive unto God in Christ in the light, uh, the Holy Spirit deals more and more, is more and more free to deal with the old life and there is less and less sin and there's more and more fellowship. More, uh, There's clearer and more intimate fellowship. And there's less and less sins that have to be confessed. There's progression there. But the Christian who uh, doesn't know that he's alive unto God in Christ, he doesn't know that uh, God has placed him in the light, he's all taken up with struggling against self, and the more he struggles, the more he sins. And the uh, first thing he knows, he's got more sin than he can handle, he's got more sin than he can confess. So he gives up. It's just too much for him. And he's just uh, born down into a deep depression because he's overwhelmed by his sin. And many, many Christians are breaking down under this load. And they feel guilty, and uh, this, the enemy makes them feel all the worse. He condemns them, makes them feel condemned. And all the time they're losing out on the wonderful finished work of the Lord Jesus, that he's interceding for them in glory, and that they can be uh, resting in the light and living in the light of glory in the Lord Jesus. And when they do sin, confess that sin, and confess it openly and freely, realizing that uh, his uh, wonderful finished work is taking care of that sin too. Uh, it took care of our past, present, and future sins. And all, all of our sins today uh, were future at that time. They hadn't even been conf uh, forgiven, uh, hadn't even been committed yet, but they were forgiven then. Everything was forgiven. 
And we get the benefit of that forgiveness, that future forgiveness, uh, today when we uh, we get the practical, every uh, practical experiential benefit when we confess those sins. We've already been forgiven completely. But we get the benefit of that forgiveness by our fellowship being restored. And we're cleansed from the unrighteousness that the, the sin caused in our lives. We're brought back into perfect fellowship with our Father. Well, let's look for a moment. Well, we better go on here a little further. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Well, uh, that's that's uh, that's what he's given us these identification truths for in Romans 6, 7, and 8, that we learn to abide in the Lord Jesus and reckon ourselves to be dead indeed in a sin, reckon the old life to be crucified, that we sin not, that we there's less and less sin, that we don't have to uh, be under the domination of, the, of sin, the power of sin. That's why he's written these things to us, so that we don't have to sin. And then if any man does sin, when we do sin, we have uh, an advocate with the Father, uh, Jesus Christ the righteous, that our Lord Jesus Christ is at the Father's uh, before the throne and he's, uh, he's our advocate. He's, he's uh, standing for us uh, before the Father. <clears throat> and he is the payment, the propitiation for our sins. So that when, uh, that when we sin, why the payment of the life of the Lord Jesus uh, takes care of that. Our, uh, that forgiveness uh, takes care of our sin. And we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. And it's through that uh, advocacy, that uh, prayer of the Lord Jesus, the intercession for us that uh, restores our fellowship. That we can uh, realize that we're living in glory in the Lord Jesus right before our Father, in, in His very presence, in the light. And that we can uh, commune with Him and uh, worship Him freely and pray to Him. That's, that's a position from which we should be praying. Our, our prayer life should be simply uh, standing before our Father in the Lord Jesus in the light and talking to Him. We're not to be feeling, well, I'm down here in this dark world and God's way off and I'm trying to reach him in prayer and uh, hoping that he hears me. Not at all. Just the opposite. We're to realize that we're in the light in Christ Jesus. Our life is hid with God in Christ and that we're to stand before our Father and our Savior, Christ who is our life, and simply talk to him and uh, tell him, confessing our sins and uh, seeking his will through the word so that we might uh, pray according to his will and uh, get to know him better, fellowship with him through the word, but from that position in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why uh, in uh, Colossians 3, <coughs> we were told to set our affection on things above, not on things in the earth. Where God said that we're, uh, in Ephesians, he said that we're uh, seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And uh, in Colossians 3, he says, Then if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's where, that's where we are. And that, that's the question I want to ask you, and I, that's the question I want to, you to ask yourself. Uh, I say to you, I ask you, where are you? As a Christian, where are you right this moment? Where are you? And you, you say to yourself, where am I? Well, we're camping. We're sojourners on this earth. In whatever work uh, we have to do in our service and in our everyday life. We're just uh, going through this world. But where is the source of my life? Where am I living? Am I living in this world and then seeking God for help to live in this world? Or am I living in the Lord Jesus Christ at, uh, before the throne of my Father? And that I'm uh, going through this world to represent Him and that He might be free to manifest Himself in and through me to affect this world. Where am I? Am I down here looking up there? Or am I realizing I'm up there and I'm looking down here? If ye then be risen, and since you are risen, 
God says, well, that's where we're, we are to abide. Let's think for a moment here of uh, Colossians 1 and uh, verse 12. <coughs> Colossians 1.12 Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, or which hath made us suitable, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Well, how has God made us suitable for uh, our abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ in the light? We look at ourselves, we look within in our hearts, and we say, well, well, Father, I, I acknowledge that there's no good thing in me. I'm not suitable at all. There's nothing in me that's suitable. I'm, I'm not even suitable to be a Christian, let alone to be abiding in the Lord Jesus in glory. I'm not even suitable to be a Christian on this earth. And myself, that's, that's uh, what we must say if we look at ourselves. <clears throat> But God isn't asking us to look at ourselves. He's asking us to look at His Son, who is our life. He's our Christian life. And uh, <clears throat> the fact that He took us through death and uh, caused us to be recreated in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we're accepted in the Beloved. God has reconciled us to Himself through the work of the cross. And we can give thanks to the Father now because He has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light because he's placed us in his son and he's our acceptance he's accepted us in the beloved and that's where we should see ourselves in christ we're not in the flesh we're in the spirit we're in the spirit of christ and as we study all of these truths dear friends that we've been talking about in these little times together so but sure these truths add up more and they fit together and they they add they uh, impress themselves upon our hearts where we more and more see our position. We see uh, where we are. They're all related, and it takes time for them to fit together. But uh, after a while, we gain confidence, and we realize where we are. And there's no more effort to believing. It's just uh, simple. Well, that's, that's, those are the facts, and that's what I uh, count upon. It's just that simple once we see. <clears throat> the knowledge of God, knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, how important it is. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, when did he deliver us from the power of darkness? He did it at Calvary. When he cut us off from the old life. We died unto sin. We died unto the world. The world whose, uh, whose God is Satan. The power of darkness. And he has crucified us unto the world and the world unto us. We're dead unto this world, we're dead unto Satan, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, into glory. And we are raised together in Christ, with Christ, <clears throat> in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And, of course, uh, since we're redeemed through his blood, then... Uh, that's a total redemption. We're, we're eternally safe in Christ. And when we sin, that same shed blood cleanses us from all the sins that we commit. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. And now let's look down here at Colossians 1.20. <clears throat> where God says having made peace through the blood of his cross by Christ by him Christ to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In his sight. And that's uh, the Lord Jesus presents us to his Father in himself. 
we in our in the old life we were alienated we were enemies to god we were dead to god but in, when we were born again and uh, resurrected in him we were reconciled in the body of his flesh through death through death we passed through death and we were brought into life new life newness of life and uh, he presented us in himself in his holiness in his unblameableness in him, his unreprovableness, that to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, in God's sight. That's how God sees us, in his Son. And God wants us, us to see ourselves in his Son, to, to uh, set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. To reckon upon our, uh, the fact that we are alive unto God in Christ. So we ask this question again, where are you? Where is the source of your life? Why, it's in heaven, it's in my Lord Jesus Christ, uh, before the throne of God. That's where God wants me to abide, that's where God wants me to live. For ye died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And this is, this is what we need amongst Christians today. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote, I uh, had a card made up some years ago and, and uh, had printed on it, uh, keep looking down. And then in small, smaller type below that, uh, for ye died and your life is hid with Christ in God. And uh, we are to uh, take our position in the Lord Jesus by faith above all of this, the circumstances of our life and the situations that we're in and above this world. And we are to Rest in Him, in the Father's presence, in the light, and in fellowship with Him. And we're to be very jealous of that position. And when we sin, when uh, we turn to self and depend upon self, and uh, self is active and there's sin, we're, we're to uh, freely and honestly confess that sin to God. And the Lord Jesus immediately cleanses that sin, cleanses it away and uh, cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and we're back in fellowship with God. And uh, true, God may have to take us through things in chastening and chi child training us because of that sin, but it'll be in love, it'll be for our good, and we'll understand that, and we'll know we've got it coming, and we'll know that it's our training. So God wants us to see ourselves as he sees us. In ourselves, no good thing. In our Savior, in the Lord Jesus, who's our life, uh, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That's how God sees us. That's how he wants us to see us as new creations in Christ. That uh, Christ is my life and that I'm accepted in him. That's what Christians need to see. They need to see their acceptance. Christians are, are, for the most part, are uh, struggling under an intolerable burden of uh, self-condemnation, of uh, utter guilt, uh, overpowering guilt, because they uh, they feel that they're under the burden of their sins, that they don't feel that they're forgiven, all the sins that they're committing, and they're, uh, they don't feel that they're cleansed from all this unrighteousness. And uh, Satan uh, points his finger at them and says, Look at you. Look what an awful sinner you are. What a hypocrite you are. And we have to look in our own hearts and admit that. But the thing that most Christians aren't doing, uh, they're not going beyond that and saying, But I'm uh, depending upon the Lord Jesus for my Christian life. I'm uh, abiding in him. And Satan, of course, can't point his finger at the Lord Jesus, ever. So that's where we are to hide. Well, we can't hide there unless we know that God has already hidden us there. We need to see these truths before we can abide in Him. We need to see that we're abiding where God has already placed us. Otherwise, abiding is a effort, and we try to uh, stay in Him. We try to more or less get into Him. We try to abide in Him because we don't know that God has already placed us there. And abiding means just simply to rest where God has already put us. And God alone could put us in His Son. And where did he do it? 
He did it at Calvary when we uh, were resurrected in him. And why did he do it? Because of the finished work of the cross, because God, the Lord Jesus, paid all the penalties and uh, we, God was free to recreate us in his son. The Lord Jesus took care of the sin problem fully. And God was uh, holy and just and righteous in uh, redeeming us and uh, recreating us in his, in his own beloved Son. And these are the things that we need to see. Now, dear friends, these, these truths are presented so that we can simply depend upon them and uh, we can begin to really function in the Christian life. God, God is for us. God has done all the work required and he's waiting for us to find it out and believe it. It takes study. It takes hunger. But he's waiting. Paul said, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And that, that's, that's what's keeping Christians down. That's what this uh, terrible, uh, there's so much of this terrible uh, depression amongst Christians there, in darkness. They're just borne down. Uh, they have an, uh, their conscience is, is just uh, ruined. They have an evil conscience because of all their uh, sin and their sinfulness. And, and they're, they're taken up with themselves in their sin instead of uh, concentrating upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness and their place in him. And Paul says, uh, Hebrews 10, 22, uh, says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And we think of uh, Hebrews 9, 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And Christians can have a purged and a clear conscience when they see that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses away their sin and cleanses them from all unrighteousness and their conscience is clear again. Their conscience is purged. And that's what we need to see so that we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, the need is always and the need is now. And the work is done forever that uh, a Christian's never going to take his position in the Lord Jesus and stand before the throne boldly when his conscience is, uh, conscience is uh, evil, evil conscience, and he's just borne down by the weight of his sins. <clears throat> God has taken care of our sin problem. He's asking us to confess our sins to him and then to believe. Confession doesn't do any good uh, as far as we're concerned if we don't believe that God, uh, the finished work, uh, takes care of the sins that we confess. We must uh, believe in the, in the precious blood that cleanses away the, the unrighteousness of these sins and that we're uh, brought back in fellowship with our Father who's longing to fellowship with us, who's just simply waiting, and he's provided the means to maintain this fellowship. Well, we're going to close. We're going to close this little series here and now. We're not going to go any further in the book. The book can help us. Uh, the reckoning that counts can be a lot of help to us. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, it's uh, keeping in fellowship with the Father and, uh, fellow and talking with Him and uh, worshiping Him and coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ better in our position in Him. <clears throat> and when our eyes are open to the light of our position, uh, we know that we're new creations in Christ and uh, that the blood of the Lord Jesus uh, and the work of the cross uh, frees us from the darkness of our condition of self and that we can live in the light of the Lord Jesus in glory. And we uh, judge ourselves and we confess our sin and then we know that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness and we're uh, able to remain in blessed fellowship with him, uh, partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light, here and now. And that's, that's uh, 
these are the things we must concentrate up upon before we can become mature and before we can be of any use to God with others, really. That we're not taken up with the civil war in our hearts, that uh, we realize that God uh, won that war at Calvary and we're, we're free from all, uh, all that and we're, we can quietly rest in the Lord Jesus in the light. He needs responsible, restful, quiet Christians who who know the Lord Jesus well enough to know what he's done for them and what he is doing for them in his cleansing blood and in his uh, intercess, intercession on our behalf to keep us in fellowship with the Father and with himself. And then, then uh, on that, when we learn that, when we rest in him above, far above, then we're uh, free to function in this world. We're not... Uh, we're not governed by the world. We're free from the uh, effects of the world. And we're free to be used by our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. Right down here in this world. And we can become involved with these poor lost souls about us. And we can become involved with Christians who are hungry to grow. And we can be useful to them. And we're not all taken up with uh, personal problems. Personal defeats. And all of this. And God can use us to open the the eyes of the lost and to open the eyes of hungry Christians and to turn them from darkness to light, the light that we're learning to abide in, and from the power of Satan unto God, that the lost may receive uh, forgiveness of sins and uh, come to know their inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, uh, that's what God is after for each of us. That's what he's after.